you breathe a word of what you've seen here, it will do time for treason. I hate that! I know you do! Do you have any idea what a pain you are? I think so, sir. Jim! The beast is that way! You all right? You dare threaten me? Thor was so puny a weapon. What? He was freaking me out! Hey! This is the first marker. The path is alive. You're talking about the moment of creation. Open the doors and tell the world the truth. I'm Tony Stark. I build neat stuff. I got a great girl. And occasionally, save the world. So why can't I sleep? Two more. A girl's waiting over here. I got you now. I got everything going for me. Life is funny. Uh, girls. But it's also strange how things can be so different than you think. You know what I always wanted to be? President of the United States. Look, when you're in office, you gotta do a lot of things sometimes that are not always, in the strictest sense of the law, legal. But you do them because they're in the greater interests of the nation. Right, wait, just so I understand correctly. Are you really saying that in certain situations, the president can decide whether it's in the best interests of the nation and then do something illegal? I'm saying that when the president does it, that means it's not illegal. Hi everyone, and welcome to the Academy's Visiting Artists series, um, the Film Aid um, edition for sound. Um, my name is Terry Dorman. I am a supervising dialogue editor. I also am one of the three governors in the sound branch of the Academy. Um, and it is, I'm really happy to be joined by Peter Devlin today, who is a production mixer. At the top of this, we saw a few samples of his work. Peter has been uh, a production sound mixer for over 30 years. He's been nominated for an Academy Award five times. He has worked on over 75 films. And it is my pleasure to introduce my friend, Peter Devlin. Hi, Peter. Hi, Terry. Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, I should note that there's some of your work in those clips as well, since our association goes back many years. Yes, I was lucky to have worked on your tracks. We've done, I think, seven films together during a 22-year period, I think. But why don't we start from the beginning, Peter? Could you tell me a little bit about your history, how you got started in the industry, and what things might have inspired you to go into sound? Sure, well, I'm originally from Belfast in, in Northern Ireland. And uh, in the 70s, uh, Northern Ireland was going through a turbulent time. And I can remember just the importance of going to the movies. And I just absolutely love going to the movies. Uh, we lived in Belfast for a period of time. Then we moved to a little coastal town called Port Stewart. So, uh, the, it was quite difficult to get to the movies, but there was one movie that I definitely wanted to see, which was in the uh, summer of 76, so either 76 or 77, and it was Jaws. Jaws was the film that totally changed my life and my direction, and it was a film that had obviously got a lot of hype here in the, in the US, but it was... Uh, I think a book that I discovered called The Jaws Log by the writer Carl Gottlieb, and he worked on the film as well. But that book, and I'll just grab it here. I actually still have the book, The Jaws Log. This was a behind the scenes of the making of the film. And that just, I couldn't wait to see the film because it just seemed an eternity from when I was reading about how the film was made to actually seeing it in the theater in Belfast. And I went when I, in the theater in Belfast, you call it the cinema. We went to the cinema and I went with my cousin who was two years older than me. And I remember just sitting with such excitement and those opening chords of John Williams. And what was your first job um, in sound that well, was in Ireland? 
the thing is, my father was an accountant. Uh, the rest of my family were teachers. I went a very non-traditional route in that uh, it, I was encouraged to take up civil engineering at the local university. And what I wanted to do was get into film, and I had no idea how to do it. My careers office here at school wasn't able to kind of point me in the right direction. And my principal of my school when I was leaving uh, in, in the summer of, of uh, 79, 1980, uh, he said to me this idea of working in the film business or television business was pie in the sky. It always stayed with me, that line, pie in the sky. And I'm like, well, I'm going to figure out how to do this. And fortunately, there was an advertisement in the local newspaper, and it was for a trainee audio assistant. And uh, I thought, well, the BBC produces radio programs, television dramas. That's a great way in. And of course, I knew nothing really about audio. I was fascinated with film, the language of film but knew nothing about audio. So I remember I sent in the application and thought, well, if I get called for an interview, if I'm lucky to be called for an interview, I need to do some research. And I went into the local library and found books on sound recording and basically crammed this information, took notes down. And I got a letter from the BBC inviting me for interview. And I remember going for that interview and it was just, it was, I think a panel of four and they talked to me about what is it I liked about the BBC? What is it I liked about radio, television? Uh, did I enjoy films? And they were able to focus me on just kind of my general interests. But then they started to get into the hard stuff of sound recording. And fortunately, from my visit to the library, I had enough experience to skip through that interview. And then I did a second interview with the head of engineering and seemed obviously past that and then uh, got it, uh, invited to join the BBC. So I had to go on a training course, uh, which started actually it's 40 years ago this month in April. Uh, April of, of 81 is when I set off from Belfast to the BBC's engineering centre just outside um, Birmingham in a place, little town called Evesham. And the, it was an amazing facility that had uh, people that were working in film editing, that were working in directing and camera and sound. So the BBC gave me this amazing training in all sorts of disciplines. So when I did my training course, I went back to Belfast and I worked in news, I worked in current affairs, I worked in radio dramas, and I find myself leaning towards the drama element. I loved being in, in a radio studio, being a participant in a radio drama, doing sound effects fully, so anyway, that's the, that's the short version. It's interesting that your experience is practical experience as opposed to going to film school. But what got you from Ireland to the United States? Well, there's an interesting journey. So I'm, I'm working at the BBC in Belfast and I'm thinking, okay, that what I really want to do is work in movies. I, you know, I'm, I'm going to the cinemas, I'm, I'm watching Apocalypse Now, I'm watching Star Trek, I'm you know, really enjoying big blockbusters from the, from the US. And uh, I started to write to studios. I wrote to 20th Century Fox. I wrote to Warner Brothers. Uh, I wrote, I think, to the producers of Steven Spielberg's Indiana Jones to say, you know, dear sir, madam, I work for the BBC in Belfast. Could I visit the set? <laughs> of course, I didn't get very many responses, <laughs> but I got a response from one filmmaker that I admire hugely, and his name is Michael Mann. I wrote to Michael Mann in 87 and said, dear Mr. Mann, I'm a sound engineer working for the BBC in Belfast. I'm a huge fan of your television series, Miami Vice, because Miami Vice was one of the more popular TV shows in the UK in, from 1985 to 87. And uh, I asked him, would it be possible to visit the set? Because I was really intrigued with just, it was a high, it was a very glossy production big budget, car chases, and the music was such an important part of the sound of it. So I sent this letter off and it was within, I think a month, I got a response. And I just remember it came into the crew room in BBC in Belfast and I saw the, BB, the, the Miami Vice logo and my heart was beating so fast. And I thought, okay, I'm, it's gonna be a rejection, dear sir, thank you for your interest. But, but here was Michael Mann, signed for Michael Mann, inviting me to the set of Miami Vice. So that letter changed the course of my life. So never underestimate the power of the written letter as opposed to the written email. A written letter really speaks for something. So that's 
kind of the first step in my journey to the U.S. It's also a good lesson to anybody wanting to get in the industry is putting yourself out there. And you never know. Uh, you, all you've got to do is ask at a certain point. Persistence. I mean, Chris Monroe, who's uh, an acclaimed uh, production mixer from the UK, talks about how he was uh, working at a gas petrol station in the UK when he somebody pulled in in a car and he heard something about he worked at the film studio at, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether it was Pinewood or EM uh, Elstree, but just from hearing Overhearing that conversation, Chris spoke to this guy, and the next thing is that kind of opened up the door for him into the film industry. Everybody has a way of managing, I think, if they can follow their dreams, always to have that focus and persistence. So, absolutely, I think that's great. And your first job in the United States, in moved to Florida, is that correct? I, I moved to Florida, and that really was a result of that letter to Michael Mann again. I, when I visited the set of, of Miami Vice, I spent, uh, I think it was two days with the production team. And I remember when I arrived on set, the assistant directors were telling me, don't, don't talk to the actors, you know. And I'm like, I'm not interested in the actors. I want to hang out with the sign team. And the production mixer was a gentleman called Joe Foglia. And Joe was mixing the, the TV series uh, with uh, his boom operator, uh, Scott Blander and, uh, sorry, Jeff Blander and Vince Nuccio. So that was a three person team. And uh, Joe contacted me when I went back to Belfast after the fact and said, hey, look, you seem quite interested in working in the US. When I'm doing Miami Vice, my company does commercials, low budget indies, would you be interested in, in joining the company? So I went to my boss at the BBC and say, I've been given this opportunity in the US. Could I go out there, see what it's like? Could you keep my job open here at the BBC in Belfast? And he said, well, that sounds like a great opportunity, but we definitely would not keep your job open here. <laughs> You've got to go for it. So I left in Christmas of 87, having been with the BBC for almost seven years and thought, okay, I'll give it a go. And I went to Miami and that's where I started my career in, in the US. And after that, were you working on many feature films in? No, I, I started in a television series, uh, which is called The Adventures of Superboy. It's my kind of um, first foray into superheroes, which uh, I continue to this day, having just worked on Wonder Woman 84 that just came out recently. and in the world of robots with Transformers so uh, and in Iron Man. So it all started with uh, The Adventures of Superboy, which was produced by the same team behind the Superman movies. Uh, they produced a movie called Christopher Columbus, The Discovery. So that was kind of the first big feature film I did, which was in 1991, and that was with Marlon Brando. That was uh, kind of uh, early days in, in the sign career. So, and in, may I say, just technically too, that was in the day, days of quarter inch recording, uh, recording on tape, and, and we've come uh, a long way since those quarter inch days. I think we can get into the technology changes a little bit later, because that certainly affected your oh. career and my career. Um, but when you first started, were you, did you start as a production mixer, or did you start um, in an assistant capacity as a boom operator? No, I started as, a, as an assistant when I was, I mean, the, the wonderful thing about working from the BBC is one week I could be working on the Ulster Orchestra setting microphones. Uh, the next week I could be working one of the current affairs shows running the board, which was, I think, like a 16 channel board. Uh, with outside sources of telephones. And uh, if you were, you know, doing a live link to uh, a reporter in London or in Wales or Scotland. So uh, working in at the BBC gave me that opportunity just to look at all the different areas of sound, whether it be working at a, a boxing match or a, a soccer match, uh, rugby, uh, a musical show, uh, traditional music, traditional Irish show. Uh, there was a, a TV series called uh, As I Roved Out, and each week they had uh, a different band that would come in. Sometimes it was Van Morrison and the Chieftains. So I would have been working in the floor as an assistant. Uh, John Lunn was one of our senior recording engineers at the BBC who was absolutely amazing on the panel. So I was lucky to have great mentors at the BBC. Uh, Dixie Dean, who kind of was head of the uh, drama. Yeah, he, he was the person that 
would always end up mixing on the on the drama show. So Dixie was somebody that kind of took me under his wing and allowed me uh, to do uh, second boom on the Fisher boom, which is the platform boom on dramas. Uh, and then there was another mixer called Peter Lindsay that uh, worked in film dramas. I, I worked with him. So I had a little bit of time in all the different disciplines of sound. And that's what was so great about working for the BBC, being able to work in those assistant capacities and also stepping up to mixing. When I left the BBC, it was I was an audio supervisor. So I was starting to do bigger shows and um, but my love was really I wanted to get into feature films. It sounds like your experience there would benefit you later in some of the films that you took on because you were working with crowds, you were working with with various um, situations that would enable you to do films like Any Given Sunday where you were dealing with large crowds. Yeah, I, I, you, you bring up uh, Any Given Sunday and you know, I think uh, that was a particularly difficult film um, because it it was at technically it was a, at a stage where we were still kind of transitioning from digital audio tape to what's going to happen next as a, as a recording medium, and it was where I would have loved to have had a lot more channels to because there was so much happening on the different sets that uh, we were filming on. But there's a there's a scene in the film that uh, I, so many people have talked about, and it was where, where uh, Al Pacino as Tony D'Amato was giving a pep talk to the, uh, his, the teammates, his, his team in the locker rooms. Because that's what living is. The six inches in front of your face. Now I can't make you do it. You gotta look at the guy next to you. Look into his eyes. Now I think you're gonna see a guy who will go that inch with you. You're gonna see a guy who will sacrifice himself for this team because he knows when it comes down to it, you're gonna do the same for him. That's the team, gentlemen. And either we heal now as a team, or we will die as individuals. As football guys, that's all it is. Now, what are you gonna do? <laughs> It's such an inspirational speech that I just, every time I see it, it stops me because I get goosebumps because I remember that day and I, and I remember Pacino was just so perfect. Somehow or other you compensated because what's on the screen is, is quite amazing. If you, if you look at that film and analyze how many things are going on at once and your coverage of that is pretty uh, phenomenal. As a sign mixer, it's all about the authenticity of performance. And even looking at those opening clips that I was looking at this morning, um, you know, whether it be Chris Pine as Captain Kirk or and um, uh, uh, Charlie Theron uh, as Aileen Warnes and Monster, our job as sound mixers is to record a true performance. And I, I'm always amazed at how between action and cut that they create this magic. You know, and, and the role of a production mixer is so different to what happens in post-production. We're just trying to uh, fight all the different elements. I think this is a good point to make at this, at this point in, the, in our conversation is that the different levels of sound and the fact that you're at the beginning and what you are recording and capturing is the true performances of the actors, the actual um, what's going on on the set, whether or not it's a practical set or whether it's a, a sound stage, and your position on this is is the beginning of that circle of talent. Specifically dealing with your production mixing, I'd like to know who your team of people is that back you up on any given project. How many people are with you? Well, uh, traditionally you have 
yourself as a production mixer and you have your boom operator and you have a utility and that utility is the uh i was going to say least experienced person but you really need an experienced person because the utility really is a second boom operator as well and he may he or she may not be as experienced as the main boom operator but they have to come in normally at the last minute to be the additional boom now because of the way films have become bigger, there's more cameras. There are more, uh, there are bigger sound crews now in the UK. You'd find um, Simon Hayes when he was doing Les Miserables or Chris Monroe, who's on the new J on, on the new Mission Impossible film is working with, uh, their term is assistant signs to a first assistant sign and a second assistant sign. And uh, there are sometimes trainees on those films as well. So you've normally got a three or a four person sound crew. Uh, on any given Sunday, it was much bigger because we were able to have a second unit. But the boom operator and the second boom operator or utility are basically your eyes and ears on the set. They're your voice on the set. And uh, I worked with Kevin Cherky I for, for many years, uh, who's uh, originally from Miami. He now works in Atlanta. And there's a, a shorthand between you. I'm sure you find yourself when you're in the cutting room, if you're working with another colleague and you've worked with them for years, there is a shorthand between the two of you. You know exactly how each other works. So you and I have both worked on Michael Bay films and Michael's films are big, spectacular. Pearl Harbor was a, a, a tough film because of the scale of the film, but also the fact that Michael likes to use multiple cameras and also likes to use a lot of pyrotechnics and effects and you're trying to get that dialogue in there. And, and if there's a film that kind of changed the course of my life, it was working with him on Bad Boys. Shit! I need backup on canal, now! You just get ready to shoot. Hey, your badge! He has a gun! Shoot him! His films are big and bold. The sound design is big, and sometimes it's it's a it's a wrestling match to save that production track, as you well know. Yes, I was going to say, but the 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 thing is, is you've now worked with uh, Michael Bay on several films. Does that give you a shorthand with the director so that you possibly have his ear so that you can communicate to him whether or not, you know, the sound in that particular area? I know Michael, of, of all people, is very concerned about his the visual shot of things. I remember in Pearl Harbor, there was a scene in the hospital and uh, the curtains were blowing. And it was the wind machines that were blowing the curtains. And he didn't care about the, the dialogue at that particular point. He wanted to make sure that those curtains were blowing. Well, first of all, when it comes to uh, actors within that scene, you want to make sure they're all radio mic It used to be a time where you would, when a director comes in to block a scene, you would try to say, okay, we can boom this. We can maybe use a radio mic there, but now, it's traditional to kind of put radio mics on the actors because you don't have time to make that change. And back in 2000, when uh, we were shooting Pearl Harbor, uh, I was using a, a Diva 2, which is a four track recorder. And I remember when Michael blocked that scene, I'm like, I don't have enough channels. I don't have enough ch uh, rec uh, channels on this recorder to be able to do this scene. And then I think I pulled in probably a DAT machine, which was, able to give me an additional two tracks and then you start to prioritize okay so we can use a boom mic on on this part of the scene we can use a radio here so it's really just try to isolate and and look at the priorities within that scene and today you know behind me here this recorder is able to do 24 tracks i would love to have had that back then but you do what you can with, with the tools that you've got not knowing what lies ahead in the future but that particular scene because of the movement that basically the, the the boom operator 
uh, Donovan Deer moved with the camera. So it was almost documentary style. It was almost bringing what I learned from my background and working at the BBC and just what one microphone can do. And I'll give you an example. I have a little microphone here. One microphone can do so much to capture a scene. And there were there are times where you can just get uh, focused on putting too many radio mics out there. So, um, but one microphone can do so much. And, and, and probably a lot of that was done on one microphone as well. And we like to use stereo mics as well for crowd sequences. I think people also need to know you're not actually right there where the um, action is taking place. You're set aside. It's kind of hard to describe your physical distance from where the actors are performing that particular scene. It's mostly, you touched on it, to say that it's your boom operator that's right there. So um, I think it would be helpful to show your distance from, from the actual scene being shot. Yeah, I mean, the, on any given Sunday, I was quite far from the action and we would have to run a, a multi-cable out to our wireless receivers to get the signal back. Um, so every project is different. And now with the reality of the COVID world, you can be further away uh, from the action. I, I like to be closer than many people because I like to feel a part of the action. I love to be able to walk on the set. I love to be able to see the problems that the boom operators have. But yeah, normally I'm maybe within 100 feet of the set. Um, the uh, sequences in Pearl Harbor where the Arizona was tipped over, I was very far away because that set was so huge. And you're pushing the technology of the uh, radio mics too, because I remember Donovan was Donovan Deere who was booming on that particular film. Um, really, we were just at the end of our transmission path for our radio mics um, with, with where he was. And uh, the, the beauty of, of what you do is you can fix all our mistakes. <laughs> so, um, and everything, I think all of us, you know, whatever I get through my hands then goes to a recording mixer, but it's fun dealing with your tracks because they're so crisp. Can you, can you go over what your process is when you start a film? You, you go um, and do a technical scout on, this, on where they're gonna shoot. Um, do you see what your problems are? Who do you consult with when you're first starting on a film? To me, that's a really important thing to do is to be able to go and see the practical locations that you're going to shoot in. And sometimes it's a question of timing, logistics, you're in another movie. But when I break down a script, the one thing I'm looking for is how many actors are in the scenes? Is there going to be music involved? Is there going to be additional manpower that we're going to need? For example, with, with Black Panther, uh, that was a film that I wasn't able to go on the technical scouts on. Um, uh, they were shooting at a place called OFS that was doubling for Wakanda. And unlike Wakanda, we were dealing with a, a, a factory that were half of it uh, was a working factory. So you would ha hear uh, forklifts transformers and also the local interstate uh, but from the production's point of view they had this huge parking lot where they were able to uh, build these huge blue screens and in particular there was a huge sequence with uh, T'Challa and uh, Killmonger and uh, Forrest Whitaker where uh, they go to battle and at that point, I, costumes weren't an issue. It all had to be boomed uh, because it was kind of just bare knuckle fighting and swords. And uh, what we dealt with was three cameras. We're doing three cameras and wides and tights. And those, when you shoot wide and tight, that can always be a problem because you're trying to get the microphone to service the, the closest camera. And uh, fortunately, we had blue screens, so we were able to really push the frame there. But the one thing that we were dealing with was because of the water, because we were shooting at this waterfall, there was practical effects. And the cameras all had uh, special adapters on the lenses that would deflect the, the water if it hit the lens. The problem is that they would start it up during the dialogue 
and part of a, the job as a production mixer, it's all about negotiation. You got to negotiate with the gaffer about the lighting ballast that's making a noise on set or the camera operator who is, you know, shooting a wide shot and a tight shot and you talk to the director about is there any chance we can shoot the wide shots first and then but our job has now become to be able to adapt to those circumstances and there are some directors that are pretty adaptable and they understand the difficulties that you're having and then there are other directors that say you know we've got to go i don't we don't have time i'd love to be able to accommodate sound here but the sun's going down this three camera setup will just make my life much easier. And sometimes there's not even time for that conversation. But that particular sequence was uh, worked out well because we talked to the camera team and they turned uh, they turned this uh, this adapter off so that we were able to get the dialogue clean. And at the end of the clip that uh, our viewers should be able to see, you'll hear the high pitched whine come in after Forrest Whitaker says his line of dialogue. Let the challenge begin. Let the challenge begin. So that's about negotiation, but we didn't know that the camera department were going to have those elements on their cameras. So that was kind of problem solving on the day. A lot of the, uh, the one thing as a production mixer, it is about problem solving. You're, you're in real environments. It's real life. You showed me a prime example of that. And you asked me to visit the set once. And I think you were shooting uh, Daredevil when you were downtown. Los Angeles, and this was this a prime example of them not allowing you on a, uh, a scouting to know what your location is because you invited me up there, you were um, up on the roof, and you said to me, "Look what I have to deal with. There's gravel on the rooftop, and these actors were walking all around, which means that anything that was being recorded was going to pick up their feet." But you quickly. Uh, adapted can you tell me how you did that no it's funny thing when I, when I think about daredevil i think about a cricket that was uh chirping during a particular scene and george flores who's my utility literally trying to search out for this chirp uh during a kind of it was one of the romantic moments between ben affleck and jennifer garner but if the camera's not seeing the floor we would normally put uh, carpeting down to try to muffle any noises that are going to obscure the soundtrack. Uh, that's kind of just, I mean, you, you watch a movie like Downton Abbey and hard surfaces, hard floors. Uh, I just remember in front of Downton Abbey, there was this huge graveled area. And I remember seeing a behind the scenes photograph of the amount of carpets that were put to kind of muffle the footsteps of the actors as they move around. Uh, I've worked with the director, Joel Schumacher, who, uh, when he saw me putting carpets down, got really irritated and said, I, I hate the sound of Foley. I want natural sound effects, but the natural sound effects obscure the dialogue. So you're trying to, you know, strike a balance. Uh, there are films that, I, it's funny, when I think about Foley, I love good Foley. There was, um, the Kate Blanchett in the film Elizabeth. I just remember the beauty of those food steps that are some were done on location, that were some uh, done afterwards. And that is, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about all the elements that go into the work that we do. We try to strip everything away to give a, uh, 
to make it as clean as possible for people in your world to come in and use their imagination to tell a different story. Uh, for example, Chris Pine did a walk and talk on Wonder Woman 84 and Chris drags his feet. And I would have to say to him, Chris, can you pick your feet up? Because his scuffs on the, on the, on the concrete was obscuring the dialogue. We eventually, thanks to the wardrobe department, we actually resold his shoes whenever we made the company move to the UK. Another, uh, the, the fact that we can get the wardrobe department to work alongside us to, to make changes. I, I wanted to bring up some of your work that you've done um, that's quieter, that's a dialogue sequence, something like Frost Nixon. And I had the pleasure of working with those tracks. And I just want people to realize that because of the way you recorded these things, the sound itself becomes a dramatic part of the emotion of a scene. There was a particular scene with the um, the last interview between Frost and Nixon and his swallow, his inhale, his exhale were so dramatic and so clean that it made my job really easy and it sounds pristine. Is Hunt three, don't we have to handle the Hunt situation? Four, get the million bucks. It would seem to me that would be worthwhile. Five, don't you agree that you better get the hunt thing going? Six, first you've got the hunt problem. That ought to be handled. Seven, the money can be provided. Ehrlichman can provide the way to deliver it. Eight, we've no choice with hunt but the $120,000 or whatever it is, right? Nine, Christ, turn over any cash we've got. And I could go on. Now, it seems to me that someone running a cover-up couldn't have expressed it more clearly Look, than that. Let me just that. stop you now right there because you're doing something here. Which I am not doing and I will not do throughout these entire broadcasts. You're quoting me out of context, out of order. And I might add, I have participated in all these interviews. It's, is it more difficult to, to uh, shoot a, a plain book dialogue scene than it is an action scene? Uh, it can be. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, with Frost Nixon, that was a film where these two actors had already worked on the stage version. So they were incredibly prepared. And I can only think of two occasions where they flubbed their lines in the film. Uh, they were so perfect. Michael Sheen as David Frost and Frank Nigella as uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, and what I loved about those guys is, well, uh, Michael Sheen is, 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 a, is a great character, very funny, but Frank Nigella stayed in persona as the president. So when we had to put a microphone on him, we had to call him Mr. President. I never saw him out of character through the whole movie. And that um, big final interview uh, that you talk about, the, the silences that were part of the scene, part of the dramatic moments. And uh, we were using um, close mics and we also had their uh, period microphones as well, because I give those to you as a choice to, to be able to use if needed. Uh, but I just remember that, you know, it was, it was electric. It was, and I think uh, David Frost had actually come to set, the real David Frost had come to set during those uh, final days on the film. And uh, it's a film that I'm certainly very proud of because it is, it's all about the dialogue and Hans Zimmer did the score and there's a minimal minimalism to his score. Um, and, you know, music is such an important part of films because it can, move you and we have no idea how a film is going to end up my job is to record the performance as well as i can to give it to you where you can clean it up and and assemble it and give it to the re-recording mixers and uh, maintain that authenticity and for the composers to come in to punctuate it with the way they do and the foley artists and in midge Carson's uh, documentary uh, making waves. You talk about that circle of talent, all these different people that come together that we don't always know each other. And I've been fortunate to, to know you over the course of 20 years. And I still get excited when I go to a dubbing stage and hearing that original production track and how it's improved and how it becomes just a new life form in itself because of the talents of others. Because I would be lost going into a Pro Tools session and 
cutting a scene and you'd be lost coming onto a set and dealing with the politics and the machinations of, of a production. It's the collaboration that goes on between these different elements of the soundtrack of a motion picture that are so wonderful. It's even, it's even the choices that are made on a dub stage. Should we go on to... I think there's some questions from our students. From our students. I do have, um, maybe we should clarify the term sound design. Can we go into that a little bit so that people can understand? It seems to me that sound design starts from the script and it starts from between the dialogue, the descriptions of what is gonna take place in that particular scene. And it carries through to the director's vision of how he wants the film to sound. Your, your con contribution is part of the sound design. My contribution is part of the sound design. There are also people that do sound design for specific elements of say non-existent um, creatures. Uh, but I just want to clarify that sound in general is so many different levels. And um, maybe you can touch on that too a little bit before we go into question. Yeah, it's, I've been asked so many times when people have come to visit me on set, you know, do you put the music in now? You know, do you do the sound effects now? They think that what we do on set is the finished soundtrack. And people have no idea of just the number of tracks and the weeks and months that go in to a finished soundtrack. And just how uh, a re-recording mixer sound designer looks at a script so very differently from me. I mean, I touched on this earlier. When I look at a script, I'm looking at how many actors are I'm, am I going to be working with? In a particular scene, does it mean I'm going to need more channels on my mixing console, more radio mics? When um, when you look at my notes, you're looking at those problem areas where there may be noise obscuring a performance. Uh, the sound designer is looking for creative moments that he can find within the script that may not be in the words. Uh, you know, I look at a film like uh, Gravity that won the Academy Award so much of that takes place in space with one single character and it's about the silences and the breaths and the moments and that's also where the score can come in and and just bring you to a whole other level of emotion emotionally sound is what i find creates emotion for me you know when you turn the sound off in a film it doesn't become as interesting. It can be the most beautifully shot film, but it's the it's the sound that that brings you in, that sucks me in. It's also the idea that you know eventually this will be in a theater again, and you never want to have somebody say, "What did they say?" You want to make sure that that everything is audible and nothing pulls you out of the dramatic mm -hmm. moment or the or the comedic moment either. So you want to make sure that it, our our craft is sort of invisible. You know. Thinking of, of, of people that want to get into this industry, it is a different world today because of the internet, because of the ability to sh shoot a film on your iPhone. And uh, also just, you know, as illustrating this little microphone here, this can do so much. You have one microphone and this is a little lavalier microphone here and a transmitter. You can tell a story with your camera with those, I mean, I'm still using those today, still relying on a person holding a microphone just out of frame to tell a story. And uh, the tools are all there for film students to be able to use to tell their story. I mean, I, I was looking at um, some of the f uh, videos on, on Film Aid and it, and it was uh, a little documentary just looking uh, at life at the refugee camp and it was shot uh, very simply, but it's all about the story that's being told and sound is part of your story. And uh, I, I think it's, it's great that, you know, what Film Aid is doing and what this program is doing to be able to bring our knowledge to a whole new audience and to inspire as well. Uh, people that have touched my life and have allowed me to take this journey. You know, there's a, there's a young 
young man called Willis Abudo, who lives in Nairobi. And uh, I got to know Willis, uh, I think it was uh, when I was doing the last Transformers films, I was flying to Namibia only for two days and we were looking for Boom Man. And because of the power of the internet, because of the power of social media, I saw that Willis was, uh, was a sound mixer working in, in Nairobi and Kenya and, and he, we exchanged uh, conversations. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join me, but he's somebody that I've now followed in terms of the work that he's been doing. And he's very, very busy uh, uh, as a sound mixer in, in Nairobi. And uh, I was just talking to him last week and we were talking about microphones and the problems that I have here, he has over there, whether it be wide and tight shots or you know noisy locations. It's fascinating to see how you speak the language, whether you're thousands of miles apart, it's the same language. So you're working in sound, you, you connected with someone that you can get become, you became a mentor to someone, by your experiences, you can help them. And it's a way of, of paying it forward. And I find great satisfaction in, in, in finding these uh, diamonds and finding these people that are interested in doing sound and carrying on the work that we do. So I think whether it's film aid or whether it's your connection to, to the sound, um, the production sound mixer that you found, it's all a worthy journey and it's giving them the opportunity. So I think that's great. I actually think we covered most of the questions that were asked um, in advance. Uh, there's, there, you know, there were some things that that came up uh, as, as to having tough conversations with various departments. This was one of the questions. Um, having a conversation with the camera department, having a conversation with the director, having a conversation with costumes about how it relates to sound and how you navigate that. Well, you, you're talking about costume there. Uh, Ruth Carter was such a help on Black Panther because when I saw the costume for Black Panther. I'm like, how can we get that sound good? I mean, how are we going to get that sound at all? Because it just looks like a leather suit, but it was actually transparent. It was a, there was a spot that we were able to put in the perfect spot on Chadwick's chest, and it was acoustically it worked out great. But Ruth and I started talking very early on, and she was very aware of you know, what we needed to do. And that's what's, what's great about being able to have that time to, to work with those departments to figure out where the problems can be. Uh, on this last show that I did, uh, we were dealing with noisy lights and that was a thorn in my side through the, the course of the film. And 20 years ago, I think I would have been just so distressed, but now I know there are tools that can remove that background noise. It doesn't make me happy that I'm having to deal with it on the time, but uh, you know, at least they're there. Technology helps us sometimes, you know, the technology changes are, are coming along and I think will help us in all kinds of areas like that. If I could just mention one thing about learning, always being educated because I'm still learning. There's a, there's a film that the Academy screened uh, last year that I got to see it before COVID and it was from 1936 and it was a black and white film and it won the Academy Award for sound and it was with uh, Mary Astor, William, Walter Houston and it was directed by William Wyler. It was all shot on stage but there was a sequence that takes place in a boat and they built the, they built the front section of a boat on stage and I could see the hair moving. Now when it comes to hair moving and their clothes Riffling, you're, you're talking about Pearl Harbor, you're talking about noise. On Wonder Woman, uh, we had to deal with wind effects and that, and it is so difficult. So I'm watching this film from 1936 going, hmm, how are they doing that? How on earth are they getting such grit? Because that does not sound like it's being replaced afterwards. So, and even last week, last week uh, I was looking at a new microphone that I haven't used before. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. This is something I could definitely use. So, you know, you're always, always learning. Absolutely. Peter, I could talk to you for hours. And <laughs> fortunately, we are running out of time. I want to thank you. And I hope 
that um, everybody listening to this gained a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of understanding and we could sort of um, pull back the curtain on what we do in sound. So thank you very much. Thank you, Terry.